faces. Let me just say you all are crazy <laughs> for coming back for more, but I appreciate you coming back. For those of you who are new to this, this is uh, my name is Dan Swayze. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'll tell you a little bit more about our community paramedic projects here in a second. And what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, how to do a patient assessment as a community paramedic, which is probably the first step in figuring out how do we actually do this. Like, what are our guys and gals going to be doing with the patient once they go into their home. So we're transitioning from the why and uh, the benefit of doing these programs like we talked about a lot about today into the actual how do we get this started, what kind of training do we need to consider for this. Okay, So just briefly, I've been running a, a community paramedic program now since 2003, a little more than 10 years, when we originally got grant funding for this. At the time we were just trying to figure out whether this was a skill that EMS providers actually wanted to do as part of their thing, because it's not a natural inclination, it's not at all like the adrenaline rush, lights and sirens, I get to tube people and shock people and give drugs and those types of things. We have since then been uh, running a program consistently and under a contract with our health plan, the UPMC health plan. I have two FTEs that cover an eight county area in, in western Pennsylvania right now. We have served well over 50,000 patients, that's a very conservative estimate. And the services that we've done include biometric screenings, flu shots and other immunizations, disease management programs for CHF and asthma, care transitions, interventions, which are post-discharge follow-up care that you do within 72 hours of discharge, and high-risk patient assessments, basically going after the most vulnerable patients of the health plan, the people that are on, on Medicaid and on Medicare and have some mental health comorbidity going on and really try to get them engaged with the resources at the health plan. UPMC overall, if you're not familiar with who they are, they are the second largest integrated delivery system in the country. They're second only to Kaiser in terms of the size. That An integrated delivery system is a, a, a system that's automatically advancing here, so I'm going to have to catch myself. Um, they are the second largest integrated delivery system in the U.S. behind Kaiser. An integrated delivery system is where you have a hospital network and a health payer combined in the same system. It is the forerunner, if you will, to ACOs, accountable care organizations that you may have heard of, where they're trying to do true population health management. Okay? So the other thing that I talked briefly, very briefly about earlier today, and I'll explain a little bit more, is this Connect Community Paramedic Project. I also am the project manager for a new project in the Pittsburgh area where we have a dedicated team of community paramedics. We have two on five days a week right now, and we're soon to add a third shift on five days a week that are working with many different uh, patients in the Pittsburgh area and the surrounding county. In that county, there are uh, 40 five ambulance services that we deal with and it would be difficult for any one of them individually to start a community paramedic program so we've created a county-wide response team basically a community paramedic team that can go into patients home we get our referrals from hospitals emergency departments and from the floors directly from the social workers and the discharge planners in the hospitals we also get them directly from the EMS agencies via fax they send us the patient we the fax information is very simple we talked a little bit about referrals earlier it's a one-page form the top half of the page is just the contact information for who's sending us the referral like the provider and the bottom half is about the patient where can we find them? what's their phone number and what are you concerned about as a provider we make it as easy as we can on the person referring the patient to us because we didn't want that to be a barrier now let me uh, set the stage for you here with a video that basically describes a case that we have and then I'm going to walk you backwards through it to figure out how we actually got there and what did we end up doing for her so I'll let the video talk here as long as it starts to play this case involves a patient that we visited 72 hours after she was discharged from the hospital for pneumonia a community paramedic knocked on her door and the patient literally greeted us with the phone in her hand and she said, thank goodness you're here. I was just about to call 911. And my community paramedic said, well, that's okay. I'm a paramedic. Why don't you tell me what's going on? And she said, honey, I'm just not feeling any better. I was just discharged a couple days ago for pneumonia. And when I left the hospital, I was feeling a little bit better. But my cough is back. I can't catch my breath. And my fever's come back. And I think I need to go back into the hospital. And my community paramedic then started his patient assessment. And one of the questions he asked her was, well, have you been taking the medications that they prescribed once you left the hospital? And she said, do you mean these? And instead of handing us the pill bottles, she handed us the scripts. 
Yeah, those, said my community paramedic. Didn't you have a chance to get those filled? And she said, honey, I can't afford those medications. And even if I could, I don't have anyone to take me down to the pharmacy to pick them up. Could this happen with your patients in your service area? And if so, what would you do? So by show of hands, how many of you said, yeah, this could happen in my service area. I've got people that can't afford their meds. Everybody does, right? So what would you do was the question at the end. Well, I'll tell you what we would do. We would do what we have trained you to do. We'd break out our safety vest. We'd get our stethoscope. We'd go into traditional EMS mode, right? She's having difficulty breathing. She needs to go back into the hospital. We'd take our vital signs, our respirations, pulse, blood pressure, O2 stats, EKG, maybe take a temperature on her. We'd get a full sample history. What signs and symptoms does she have? Any allergies? We know she didn't take the antibiotics. What other medications are you on? What's her past medical history? What did she eat before we saw her? What are the events leading up to the call, right? We would do what we have trained you to do. Put her on her stretcher. We'd put her in the back of the ambulance. And do what? Take her to the hospital, right? We treat her for shortness of breath. That's what she's presenting with. But my question to you is, is any of that going to help her? It'll help her medical condition in the short run, right? She'll feel better and she'll be able to breathe better once we get her to the hospital. But is it addressing the root cause of her problem? No. So what the heck can we do differently? What is it that we can do as community paramedics that we have not been able to do in traditional EMS for this particular patient? Well, we can look at patients differently, first of all. This is how we taught... This is what we taught you that patients look like. When you look at the textbooks, if you think back to your EMT texts or your paramedic textbooks, patients didn't look like people. They looked like cross-sections, right? They consist of cells and tissues and organs and organ systems. And so a patient to you is a diabetic or they're a trauma or they're a stroke, right? We talk about patients as if the only thing going on in their life is what's broken biologically with them. What's wrong? I can fix it. Okay, we taught you to be problem solvers. Identify, assess the patient, stabilize them, get them to the emergency department for definitive care. That's the role that we played. That's how patients look. But is that how people live? Do they live with their diseases, as their diseases? Does having diabetes control 100% of your life? No. You have diabetes, but you have a life. You're married. You have a family. You live in a house. That house is in some community, whether it's a city or a, a rural environment or the suburbs or the wilderness. All of those things have an impact on your life and your health. So what we do as a paramedic, a community paramedic, is look at patients as people. We get beyond the broken biology of their disease and we get into what's going on in their life that might be affecting their health. And we start by looking at the individual patient. We do a health risk assessment. I'm sorry. Skip over that. I'm not sure why it's coming up. We do the individual health, uh, health status assessment that Matt talked about earlier. That's not the scale that we really use, by the way. It's on visual cue. But there is science to show that Patients are the best barometers of their future health care use. You ask them this question, overall, in general, how would you rate your health? Matt uses a scale that goes up to 100. We use a scale that goes up from poor to excellent. That's it. Poor, fair, good, excellent. If they rate themselves as poor health or fair health, they are statistically more likely to use health care services more often than people that rate themselves in good or excellent health. So you do your ABCs. This is one of our quick assessment tools when we walk into a home. How do you rate your health? If you're an 11 on a scale of 10, in that you're, you're in poor health, then I know, okay, we've got a lot of issues going on here that we're going to need to address. If you tell me, no, my health is excellent, I just had this recent episode or series of episodes that have caused my hospitalization, that changes the nature of the interaction for me to assess just what's going on with you, how hard I'm going to have to work on your behalf. The other thing we look at is their past medical history, like you do in traditional EMS. Except we want to know not only what diseases you have, but what do you understand about the diseases that you have. 
One of the very first, if she might have even been the very first asthma patient that I ever had as a community paramedic. I, I asked her, I said, what happens when you have an asthma attack? She had been in the hospital several times, in the emergency department several times for her asthma. She had a bunch of other issues going on. And she says, well, I usually take my, my medications. And she had, a, at that time, they had rescue inhalers and maintenance inhalers. Well, she took them both at the same time because she didn't understand what they were for. They weren't well labeled, so she just kept them both handy and just assumed that she was supposed to take both inhalers whenever she had an attack. And then she would go outside and have a cigarette because cigarettes calmed her down, right? So in her mind, I need to relax. I'll catch my breath. I'll let the medications work. I'll have a cigarette while I'm waiting for that to happen. You know what, Dan, though? I quit smoking about a month or two ago, and I, I don't think I've been back in the hospital for asthma since then. Do you think the two of those are related? Okay, so you have this patient who was a very bright patient but really just didn't understand what smoking was doing to trigger her asthma attacks, and it, it's not actually a good tool for dealing with asthma. She did just, just didn't have that comprehensive. So we taught her a little bit about what asthma does for the patient. Do they see a PCP regularly? In that same asthma study, we were amazed to find one of the things we try to do is get them connected to a PCP. So we'd call the doctor's office and we'd say, hey, look, we, if this so-and-so is a patient of yours, we'd like to get an asthma action plan together so there's some symptom management and things like that. And the doctors would say, who? We're like, so-and-so, she says she's a patient of yours. Oh, let me look. Man, I haven't seen that person in like eight years. So I tell you what, I'll be happy to talk to her about her asthma if you can get her to come in and see me from her, her asthma. It's like, okay, let's stop it. Now, is that unusual? You tell me. When you start to feel a cold coming on, and you've all felt this way, do you run right to the doctor's office? No. What do you do? You grin and bear it, right? You plow through the day, you go contaminate all the people at work that you work with, give them the virus or whatever is going around. All right, so let's say you're not going in, you're not changing your behaviors. Let's say now you're day two, you got a fever, you got a cough that you can't stop, you're hacking, you're miserable, you're fatigued. Now what do you do? You go to the doctor's office? No. You stay home, right? Now maybe I'll call off from work because I really just feel miserable. I'm going to watch some daytime television. I'm going to drink some chicken noodle soup. I'm going to drink a hot toddy or whatever else it is. I'm just going to try to plow through this. Okay, now day five comes and you're still feeling this way. Now are you going to go to the hot doctor? Maybe. For what? You can be honest. We're among friends. We've been together all day. I want a script, right? Just give me a script for antibiotics. Let's face it. If you could write your own script for antibiotics, would you ever see your doctor? <laughs> Hell no. All right? So we only go in when we're sick. The doctor has 10 minutes with us. We rarely talk about anything else that's going on in our life because in the middle of that 10 minutes, he gets like 10 seconds of poking and prodding, and the rest of the time he's on his computer documenting the visit because that's what their life is amassed to, and then you're out. So if you've got recurrent issues like asthma attacks, it doesn't ever cross your mind, oh, the doctor's too busy to talk about my health. I'm just here for the script, for the Z-Pack, right? So that's how we as Americans use the healthcare system. And it's not the doctor's fault, it's not the patient's fault, it's just the system, the way that we use these things culturally. So if they don't see a PCP regularly, where do we tend to think that they go for their primary care? To the emergency department. Anybody know why? They actually have studied this. If there's a free clinic down the street in an emergency department, most people that don't have a primary care physician and don't have health insurance will choose to go to the emergency department. Why is that? When you walk into a primary care office, or even better, a free clinic, what do you see physically when you're in there? You see magazines that are about 10 years outdated. You're seeing a bunch of people sitting in the waiting room coughing and hacking, right? You walk into the exam room, and what do you see? One exam table, a cheap, flimsy piece of paper on top of it, some otoscope things maybe, some cotton swabs and cotton balls. Who the heck knows what they use because they, they look like they've been there forever. Nobody actually opens the dang container. And that's it. When you walk into an emergency department, what do you see? I see CT scanners. I see x-ray machines. I see nurses and doctors walking around with a purpose like everybody seems like they're in a hurry and there's a whole team of people, not just the nasty old nurse that it told me to come back into the room and told me I was too fat when she put me on the scale, Right? So people perceive that they get better health care from the emergency department than they do from the primary care or the free clinic based much 
oftentimes just based on what they see physically in that environment. They don't understand that none of that equipment and none of those people are designed to treat diseases on a chronic basis. It's all designed to address episodic, acute episodic care. Okay? So this is not the place to go every time you need to see somebody for your asthma. It will fix your asthma attack. They'll do a great job of doing that. They'll get the respiratory therapist team right down there. They'll give you an inhaler. You'll get out of there. Things that you would not expect your PCP to do for you. Okay, but there's a reason they tend to use there. The other thing we ask is about hospital utilization. So if you go to the emergency department on a regular basis, are you getting admitted every time you go? Or are they rerouting you right from the emergency department? That gives me an indication, look, if I go to the ED frequently, but I'm admitted frequently, then I probably needed to go to the emergency department. That's what Greg Margolis talked a little bit about earlier as an indicator as to whether or not that ED visit was necessary. Now, the problem is, one of our patients, for example, he goes to the emergency department frequently. He frequently ends up in the ICU. Why? Because his blood sugar is over 500 every time he goes in. So, yes, he needs to get that corrected, but what's the root cause of his problem? He's not managing his diabetes, so there's an opportunity for us to get in there and help him understand dietary restrictions, how to take your blood sugar uh, and test your blood sugar on a regular basis. In his case, the reason he doesn't test it and he doesn't manage it is because he can't afford the diabetes supplies. They're expensive. When you look at the good monitors and the good strips and you're trying to pay for these out of pocket, they can run up a pretty penny, which he doesn't have. All right, so we ask him about all of these individual health determinants that are beyond the biology that we look at as traditional EMS providers, beyond the body. We also look at their medications, not unlike what you do in EMS. What are you taking? That's an important question. How are you actually taking them is something that we never ask patients in an EMS world. Okay? How do you actually take that Lasix? Well, dear, I didn't want to tell the doctor this, but you know, I, I usually only take like one pill in the morning because it makes me pee all day long. And I don't, I have bridge in the afternoon and I'm, I'm, I don't like to get up and interrupt my bridge game with my girlfriends. So I just, you know, I skip doses once in a while. Or what we hear oftentimes is, uh, well, I'm supposed to be taking that, but uh, I couldn't afford the medication. So I skipped that medication this month. I'll have to wait until next month and maybe I'll start taking that again. The doctor, the healthcare system, the, the pharmacist, at the health plan all think, oh, they're prescribed this, they had it filled, so they must be taking it as directed. But they're not. Just like that lady with pneumonia, she couldn't afford the medication, so the script was worth less than the paper it was written on because it wasn't going to do her any good. We do that medication reconciliation at that point. It's a medication inventory because you may get some pushback from some providers who say, whoa, 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 paramedics should not be doing a reconciliation. A true reconciliation involves identifying duplicative medication and drug classes. It involves interactions between the medications. Like you need to be a pharmacist or at least a nurse to be able to do that type of stuff. So we've addressed that two separate ways. One is, okay, we don't do a med rec, which you talk to doctors that actually deal with people that do med recs and they spell it with a W and a K at the end, like med rec, because it's often so inaccurate and they miss so many things based on their own memory as to what drugs interact with one another. So we do a medication inventory. Pull all of your medications out of the cupboard while I'm in your kitchen with you, and let's get them out on a table and see how do you actually take these medications. That's an important piece. The other thing, we look at the herbal supplements that go along with it, the vitamins that they're taking. If you're on a beta blocker and you're taking a multivitamin calcium, or a calcium channel blocker and you're taking a multivitamin calcium, that could prob present a problem. So we do that inventory, but then we give that back to the patient and say, take this inventory with you to every care provider you have and let them see all of the medications that you're taking because they may not know. We did one study out of an emergency department to see whether or not following people after they're in the ED and discharged home from the emergency department would prevent subsequent repeat ED visits. One of the inclusion criteria for that study, though, was that you had to have no cognitive impairment meaning you couldn't have any dementia, any Alzheimer's, any other uh, memory issues, well, you would be amazed at the number of patients who forget that they're on Alzheimer's medications, <laughs> right? So we'd pull the medications out of the cupboard and we're like, uh, hmm, well, you know, this is for Alzheimer's. Oh, yeah, I guess I was <laughs> Well, we have to exclude you from the study because you may not be able to remember the instructions we're about to give you. We do a knowledge assessment. Not only what do you take and how often do you take them, do you know what you're taking them for? 
Do you understand what these drugs are for? Oftentimes they don't. And what that leads you to believe is that they're not paying attention to what they're prescribed. Yeah, the doctor gave me that script. I just take it. I have no idea what that's for. That leads to an increased likelihood that the patient is going to make a medication error if they don't understand what they're taking because they're not signaling, hey, wait, I, I think the, doc the other doctor prescribed something that does something similar to that. They just don't care. A lot of patients will say, whatever, if the doctor gives me a script, I'll go get it filled and I'll take it without question. We ask them about barriers to medication compliance. Can you afford all your medications? Are you in the donut hole? Do you have issues with, you know, in our state, Medicaid, in its wisdom, says you can only have six prescriptions a month filled? That's fine if you're taking six or fewer medications. We had one patient take 20. It's not uncommon for frail elderly people to be on multiple medications. So the decision he had to make every month was, which six am I going to take this month? I'm going to take my painkillers, so there really were five choices left, right, in his particular case. We do ask them about individual health determinants like smoking and exercise and weight loss, but as I said earlier today, I don't expect my community paramedics to be nutritionists or exercise physiologists or dietitians. I expect them to know those people, though, and to figure out who they can call if the patient wants to modify any of these behaviors. Okay, so on an individual level, we look at all these different determinants to figure out what's going on. They influence health, right? These are the things that really drive whether or not a person's going to need repeat DD visits. But the other thing we start to look at that we pay almost no attention to in traditional EMS is past mental health issues. Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Do you have schizophrenia? These are all hugely impactful as to whether or not somebody's going to effectively self-manage their disease. If I have schizophrenia and CHF, or depression and diabetes, I'm dealing with a much more difficult scenario than somebody who's just dealing with diabetes. Okay, because of the impact that mental health can have on their life. How big is mental health as a problem in this country? I think you would be shocked. I was. When you look at the United States, and this is from the National Institutes of Mental Health, 26% of the U.S. suffers from mental illness, and 6% of the U.S. suffer from serious mental illness. 6% of 330 million people have a serious mental health illness. 1% of people in the U.S have schizophrenia with auditory hallucinations and all the other things that go along with schizophrenia. Okay? This is an incredibly common problem that we have almost no resources for throughout the country, but that we, you will deal with as a community paramedic because these are the vulnerable patients in your communities. Fortunately for us in Pittsburgh, most of those people live on the West Coast. <laughs> All right, the next thing we do is we look beyond the body, truly beyond the individual, and we start to look at their social support system. Do you have an adequate network of friends and family? Do you live alone? And you heard Mike Nolan talk about that this morning. I almost fell out of my chair when he told me, Dan, we can figure out the readmission rates for people based on three questions. I've got to tell you, my community paramedics fill out a 12-page assessment form. It takes them an hour and a half to two hours. If I go back and tell them we could be doing this in three questions, they will kill me because <laughs> it takes so long to hook up with these people and get these things. I think there's some value in doing the assessment the way we do. But one of his three questions that would predict whether or not somebody has an increased chance of being readmitted, do you live alone? Why do you think that is? Who lives alone? The elderly tend to live alone. Okay, more often than young folks do. Who else? The mentally ill tend to live alone more often than else. Even if you don't have one of those conditions and you're by yourself, I want you to think about your family situation. Okay, I'm going to presume for the moment that everybody in here has an adequate social support system in place. That may not be the case. But let me tell you the difference between the two. When I get that cold that I talked about earlier and I don't want to go to the doctors and I'm lying in bed, my wife and my kids come in on an occasional basis. Do you need anything? Can we get you some soup? Pat me on the back as I'm vomiting, hold my head up and you know, pat my hair as I'm throwing up in the toilet, whatever that is. Okay? 
You have that kind of support when you're sick. What if you're by yourself and you don't have anybody that do that for you? What's that illness like? It could be the exact same signs and symptoms, but when you're by yourself and you have a mental health issue like anxiety, you start to think, oh my God, this is it. I am so sick. I am vomiting my guts out here. I'm going to die in the bathroom and nobody's going to find me. I need to go to the emergency department. They may also want to go to the emergency department just because they're lonely. I am sick, I feel like crap, and I just want to feel like somebody cares. And those EMS guys, they're great, they're so nice to me. They take care of me, they give me a ride, they put blankets on me, they give me that loving TLC that I don't have anybody else in my life to give. That drives people to call 911. These are real issues that predict whether or not somebody's going to utilize the hospital. Not just that they're a diabetic uncontrolled, but that they have all these other issues going on in their life. Do you require assistance for daily living? Mike said this is one of the second of the three questions that they ask. If you need help bathing yourself, cooking food, keeping your apartment clean, then you're at a high risk for readmissions. Because if you're not able to do that on your own and your caregiver leaves town or breaks down, that support system goes away for any length of time, your whole world starts to fall apart pretty quickly. The example I use all the time to explain this to people is your lift assist calls. You've all been on them. You've got the 92-year-old woman who's taking care of her 95-year-old husband, and he falls out of bed, so she calls you to come do the lift assist. He's fine. He's not injured. He just needs to be put back in bed, but she can't do it because she's too weak. That's a great couple to introduce to community paramedicine. You want to keep them living independently as long as possible, but you want to make sure they have some other social support coming in to make sure that they can stay living in their home as long as possible. Do they have a primary caregiver? Do they have somebody that they can rely on to come into their house to do that? A friend of the family, if it's not a family member themselves. Hospitals oftentimes assume that the caregiver support is going to be there. So your mom or dad goes into the hospital and you live hours away, like my case. I told you earlier, my dad and mom live up in Syracuse. Every time my dad goes to the hospital, I'm there. I drop everything, I run up to Syracuse. It's a six and a half hour drive. The hospital sees me in the hospital room every day with my dad until he's discharged. So what do they assume? No, I may not live there, but I'm going to be around to take care of him. You're going to be here to take care of your dad because he needs all these other things. I was like, I live in Pittsburgh. No, I'm not going to be around to take care of my dad. Make sure he gets the resources that he needs. All right? So they just assume because they see certain things in the hospital room that that's going to translate back into the home life. That's not necessarily the case. A pulse form is a physician end-of-life form. If you're dealing with end-of-life issues, have they expressed their wishes to anybody? How do they want that conversation to go? Particularly important for the hospice patients that Matt was talking about earlier, but important in general. If you've got somebody at the end of life, like the guy with the prostate cancer, the vet that I talked about earlier, who has prostate cancer, he's in this stage. It's a terminal disease. He's going to die soon. We worked with him to make sure that people understand what his wishes are for how he wants to go and that his wife understands what to expect when that time finally comes. Okay? So we look at that social network assessment. I want to show you a video real quick of Patrick. This was a video done by the BBC. It's five minutes long. It feels like five hours long because it was done by the BBC. <laughs> it's a very slow video. But it, it shows an 81-year-old guy who volunteers at a senior center. And it explains a little bit about why he does that. Huh, just kidding. Let's see if this plays. I think because I had parents who, who brought me up to be that way, especially my, my gran and granddad, they uh, really brought, you know, helped to bring me up the way that, what to be. And helping people, because uh, my grandmother used to do quite a lot of that herself. She used to say, uh, what do you think about that? And I would look at her and say, what now? She said, well, what do you think about that? Is that the right way of doing it? And it used to click. It was the right, yeah. 
because if you can advise people what to do, then keep on shouting at them all the time, do that, do that. It's better to do it that way, because you learn better that way. How are you today? Are you all right? Good. Good morning, Princess. Good morning, my darling. How are you? You're okay? Right? Oh. I'm 81 years old now, but all the time I can get out and do things, I will. Because as I turned around and said, when you're indoors all the time, it's not good for you. It's not good for you. I've always helped people if I can. Um, yeah, I'd be, I suppose you can call that voluntary work, yes. But it's the sort of thing that I like doing. I like to help people if I can. Well, the biggest society is actually, um, I'm still trying to get my head around that. But um, the society itself, as I know it, the society itself, it is trying to help people and um, being there for people, just being there for people itself. So if they want, if they do want help, and you can help them, you do it. Especially for you, my love. Right, exchange is no robbery. You haven't finished yet. You finished? Uh, I'll watch that. I, get, I do get a little bit cross, you know, and, and I've always been a person to give way to people, I do give way, but people just seem to brush past you all the time. You could be on the floor in the street and they just walk by you, you know, like, like the other day with me. Uh, I fell over and uh, they just walked, walked, a crowd of people just walked by and it was only for one person and she, she turned around to me, she asked me if I was all right. So I said, I said, I've got to get up. Anyway, she did help me. She helped to get me up off the floor and I thanked her very much for that. But. I'm sorry, people don't help today. They're not interested. <laughs> There's going to be a time when I can't get out. And that's what really worries me. That I won't be able to get out to do anything for myself or for other people. That's my biggest fear. I want to be able to do things still. I don't want to be indoors all the time, not being able to do nothing at all. I don't want that. It's scary. It really is. I don't know how some people can do it, because I can't. I can't. No. That's me. What do you think? What struck you about the video? He's lonely. People just walk by. Did you notice as he's walking up the street, not one person looked in his direction? He's got a camera crew following him around for crying out loud. You'd think he'd at least look to see what's going on. Is this somebody famous? Nobody even paid him any attention. Did you catch the story? Because it was hard to understand him at points. He fell, and crowds of people on a sidewalk were passing him by, not doing anything to offer, until finally one young lady stops and says, Are you okay? And he says, I can't get up. So she helps him stand up. 
How about the stoop when he's bringing the mailbag in? What are the two guys there doing? Drinking coffee, talking to each other like he doesn't exist. This is the life of the homeless. I've talked to homeless people. They say the hardest thing about being homeless is feeling like you don't exist anymore. Because what do you do when you see a homeless person in the street? Oh, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to give them any money. I'm not going to look at them. I'm not going to make eye contact. Well, when you see people do that to you every day, day in and day out, you begin to wonder, like, am I even here? Do I exist? So it's incredibly difficult for them. Does he have a right to be scared about being planted in his apartment? Why? He's in his apartment. So what? You're not likely to fall if you're sitting on your couch all day long. He had no social interaction. So what? What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Patrick's on to something. Social isolation. This is a landmark study that was done in the 70s that nobody talks about unless you're in social work and social sciences. If you're a man who's socially isolated, you are 2.3 times more likely to die prematurely. And if you're a woman, 2.8 times more likely to die in a nine-year span compared to people who have an adequate social network. These odds ratios are similar to people who smoke cigarettes and are overweight. Yet you never hear social isolation being discussed as a health risk factor. If you're elderly like Patrick, now he's the exception to the rule. When you age, what happens to your social network? It shrinks. They die. Are you in a rush to go out and make new friends when you're 81 years old? Not really. Why? Because they die. And it's just too emotionally hard to carry friendships when all of those friends start dying off. And so we find a lot of social, uh, social isolation in the elderly as a protective mechanism, they believe. What they don't understand is that they're actually putting themselves at higher risk by not being engaged in some social support group or having some contact. So one of the most incredibly helpful things your community paramedics will do is socialize. We plan for an hour, hour and a half visit. On our follow-up visits, only about 20 of that is the actual intervention. The other 40 minutes is us sharing a cup of tea with the person and letting them tell us the stories that their families are tired of hearing because they heard them over and over again. Yeah, tell me about the war again, Patrick. Let's see. You know, tell me about the time that you went to so-and-so location or went on a cruise. Like, nobody in the family wants to hear that story again, but we're fresh ears. That has therapeutic value in and of itself to the point where a lot of area agency on age, agencies on aging actually have companionship programs. The volunteers, like Patrick, who go out to visit with other elderly people just so that they can have some type of social engagement. A huge risk factor. The next thing we do is look at environmental assessment. A lot of you picked up on this earlier today. Look at these two houses. What do you notice between the two of them? One is pretty run down, and the other one is okay. In fact, if you look at the cars, there's actually some nice cars there, right? I don't know how to work that part. One's boarded up. If you live in one of these two houses, who do you think is going to be healthier? The one on the right, right? The, the red or brick building, the one that doesn't have the plywood in the door. Okay? Just the environment alone. Do they have permanent housing? Homeless, obviously, have an incredibly high mortality rate if their issues aren't dealt with. And in most cities and urban areas, if you have a large municipal service, you're going to be dealing with the homeless population as part of your frequent flyer population. They come hand in hand. Can you get them into at least temporary housing, if not permanent housing? Do they have temperature controls that are adequate for the environment that they live in? We talk about environmental emergencies in EMS, right? We talk about the extremes, hypothermia, hyperthermia cases. How many of you are familiar with and Chicago in the 1990s had a heat wave. Does anybody hear that story? Okay, so I will tell you, in case you're not aware, Chicago had a period of time for about a week where the, access, the average temperature was in the high 90s for an entire week. Anywhere between 400 and 900 people died that week. There's a, there's a discrepancy because the coroner's office and the mayor's office were getting into a fight as to how many excess deaths were being caused by the heat. The mayor was trying to go with the 400 number. The coroner was saying, hell no, it's 900. 
to the point where they had to bring in refrigeration trucks as morgues because they had so many people dying. Ambulances were lined up at the coroner's office because they were bringing all these dead people in. So an anthropologist went in and did what he called a social autopsy. And what do you think he found? Who died during the heat wave? The elderly? Homeless? Poor elderly people died. Except that wasn't necessarily just the case. He looked at two communities, and I forget the names. One was Lawndale. I forget the other name of the community. It's literally right across the set of railroad tracks. They were geographically right next to each other, proximity-wise. Lawndale, I think it was, was the Hispanic community. Anybody from Chicago area? You know what I'm talking about? Nobody here? All right. So the Hispanic community was on one side of the tracks, a predominantly African-American community on the other side of the tracks. The Hispanic community was part of a growing community. People were moving in. A lot of small businesses were opening up. Convenience store. Still very poor. A lot of poor people living in that neighborhood, but a neighborhood that had some vitality to it. On the other end of the tracks was just the opposite, an African-American community that was suffering from urban blight. A lot of businesses had left the area, a lot of abandoned houses, a lot of overgrown lots where drug deals were going down. Who do you think died now? The people in the African-American community. Why? Because the Hispanic community, what do you think what would save them? Well, that's what he thought. Like, what he heard from people was, oh, the Hispanic community, they're well known for having strong family ties and supportive of one another, and they were looking out for their elderly. Well, guess what? He found those same family values in the African-American community. People said they valued that just as much. So it wasn't family looking out for these individuals. It was the fact that an old Hispanic woman or man could comfortably go down to the local convenience store where they had air conditioning without fear of getting mugged without fear of people stealing her stuff because it was a growing community. If you were an old individual in the African-American neighborhood, not only did you have to go further to get to air conditioning, but you had to pass some pretty shady areas to get there. And so they were literally scared to death to the point where they refused to leave their unair conditioned apartments and they would literally die in their apartment because they didn't want anybody to come steal their stuff or they didn't want to get mugged on the way to the air conditioning. When you know those areas in your community. You know the bad sections of your towns. You know where the bar fights are. You know where the drugs are dealt because you pick up the pieces all the time. You have to look at those neighborhoods. You have to have that level of understanding as a community paramedic so that you can understand if the exercise physiologist is recommending to your bariatric patient that they just go walk because it's a great free exercise, and you're looking at them in Pittsburgh, we have the Hill District, we say, they're in the Hill District. It is not safe for them to walk outside at night. In your bad communities, you guys have insight that other people in the healthcare system don't have. Any of those other concerns obviously could lead to an impact on their health. If you don't have utilities and it's the middle of winter and you're cold, it's going to impact your diabetes. It's going to impact your frequency to ED. You may just be going back for a warm bed and a hot meal if you don't have the income necessary to heat your own apartment. Okay, does that make sense? So far, are you with me? Individual concerns, social concerns, environmental concerns, the types of things that we look for in our assessment. We also look for transportation assessment. My classic case of this, the hospital missing the boat. They asked a the woman on discharge, you need pulmonary rehab three days a week. She was in her 30s, 40s, I think, actually had severe, severe COPD. Do you have car to get to back and forth? Yeah, I have a couple cars. Okay. Make sure you get to your appointments. I go into her home within 48 hours of her discharge from the hospital and I say, you're supposed to go to pulmonary rehab three days a week. How are you going to get there? Do you have a ride? And she looks at me like, uh, no. I'm like, okay, well, well, tell me what's going on. She goes, well, actually, we have two cars. Okay. One car's broke and we can't afford to get it fixed. And the other car... My husband, who, who works in a machine shop, he needs to take that to work every day. And they told him if he misses any more work, he's going to lose his job. So I don't know how I'm going to get to the pulmonary rehab thing three days a week. I don't have access. I'm like, okay, that's fine. We know that. So here's a case where a woman had two cars and no transportation. 
That's the type of insight that you get in people's living room, not in a hospital bed when you're telling them, okay, it's time to go home. Do you promise to behave and go to pulmonary rehab three days a week? Yes, because I want a good night's sleep in my own bed. We look at an economic assessment. Do you have enough money to pay your rent, eat, and afford your medications? All three. In many cases, they can do one of the three, two of the three, but they can't do three of the three. All right, so we look for services that can help them with those. Do you have adequate health insurance? Are you eligible for additional insurance coverage that you're not currently receiving? Are you a vet and you're not taking advantage of the vet benefits that are out there? You'd be amazed at the number of people that haven't signed up for Medicaid. They don't know how. And in fact, one of the reasons that we, they don't know how, I had one patient, who I'm still seeing actually, He's eligible for Medicaid. He has, like, I think his income each year is 6000 bucks, So he's clearly eligible for Medicaid. To get onto Medicaid in Pennsylvania, you have to go onto what's called the Compass site and fill out an online application. It takes me, with three graduate degrees, anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes to fill out the application. My patient has ADHD. How do you think that's going for him? Can he fill this out on himself, by himself? He's flying through the website. I'm like, whoa, dude, slow down. Like, you missed a whole page of questions over here. Let's go back. Like, you misspelled everything in this block. Let's make sure you spell it correctly. Don't hit the back button because that's going to lose all the information you just put on there. Like the direction said, you're supposed to hit the next button or the back button down here. So if you don't have somebody kind of guiding your patient at the level that the patient's able of functioning, then it's almost impossible for them to navigate through some of these things on their own, particularly when they have mental health issues that they're dealing with. We do a community engagement assessment. Are you involved with another care provider? Is there somebody else coming into the home that we need to know about? Because I don't want to duplicate anything that's already being done or underway for you. Are you already a part of your health plan's care management team? Do you have people calling you on the phone? Do you have home nursing coming in or home care agencies? Is the AAA coming in? Are you already getting free food and food stamps and those types of things? Let me know that stuff so I don't go chasing a rabbit hole that's not going to be productive for you. Do you belong to any civic groups or social clubs? Do you belong to a church or a temple or some other religious organization? Why? Because those organizations often provide support to their members, temporary financial help. They have people that will make meals for them on occasion. You can fill in the gaps. They're not always a sustainable solution, but they can help through the crisis that the patient goes through. In fact, the picture that you see there was a picture that I'm, I'm incredibly proud of just because we have a, a former Catholic hospital in our system, UPMC system, UPMC Mercy. One of their best social workers is Sister Joan. Like when all the other social workers in the hospital can't get something done for a patient, they call Sister Joan. Why? Because when Sister Joan gets on the phone and says, hello, this is Sister Joan from Mercy Hospital, whichever agency is picking up the phone, I think sits up a little straighter when Sister Joan calls. Like they're afraid they're going to get excommunicated or have some kind of eternal consequence for not helping out to Sister Joan, right? When Sister Joan called us and said, I got a problem I want you guys to work on, you can bet I stood up a little straighter in my chair and said, well, can we help you with Sister Joan? I have a 500-pound patient. This was in October. This patient hasn't been out of their house since April. We just discharged her home, but that was the first time she'd been out of her house. She's confined to a wheelchair, and she has two steps, literally 18 inches of elevation between her driveway and her house that she's no longer able to navigate because she needs to be in a wheelchair, and she doesn't have a wheelchair ramp. I've called five agencies, Dan, and none of them have gotten back to me, and I need to move on. I've got a patient load coming at me, I'm trying to help this woman out, but she was discharged a couple weeks ago. Like, I'm at my wit's end. I, I just don't have the time to call these agencies. Could you do that for us? Sure, let me try. Can't make any promises other than we'll try to help. We call a bunch of different organizations. Same response, no response from those civic organizations that were supposed to build wheelchair ramps for folks. So we eventually tracked down a church in a neighboring county that builds wheelchair ramps as part of their ministry work. It took us about five weeks to get on their schedule. But they volunteered the labor and the materials, and they came out the Saturday after Thanksgiving and built her a wheelchair ramp. That one. That's the guys, actually. She can now get to her primary care doctor's offices. She can get to her other appointments. This has dramatically improved her quality of life. 
and that would have never happened if we hadn't been in there to help. She had had home care. They came in, they were more worried about her developing cellulitis because she couldn't get out of the chair. She's 500 pounds. It's not like she's very active. So they came in and tried to manage the skin lesions that she was bound to develop. Physical therapists came in and tried to get her to move a little bit and exercise her legs and things like that. But everybody was overlooking the fact that this woman is homebound. She can't get out of the house because there's 18 inches between her porch and her driveway that she can't navigate on her own. An example of the types of things that civic organizations, we connected her with a church. It wasn't her church, but they were still able to come out and help her do that. Then we ask a question that I'm confident that you have rarely, if never, asked your patients in traditional EMS. Did we miss anything? Like here's a 12-page assessment that I just did. I just spent 45 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half with you going over all this stuff. What did I miss? What are your priorities? Why do you think I asked that? I could always add to the assessment other things that we need to take down. I'll even go a step further and tell you, regardless of what I find on my assessment, this is what I'm going to start with. Whatever they identify as being their priority. What if they pick something stupid, Dan? Like they need to go to the bank. That doesn't have anything to do with their health care, but they want to go to the bank. Why do you think I'm going to focus on that first? If I can help that individual with their highest priority, I'm doing two things. One is, I'm not judging you. I'm here to help. I don't care what your lifestyle is. I don't care if you're a drug seeker in the emergency department. I don't care what your issues are. If you tell me what your priority is, I'm going to earn your trust by working on that priority. It's directive. I don't mean to tell you that we go grocery shopping for them all the time. We run them around to their appointments. We will do that on occasion. There's no doubt. It is directive. I will eventually get to my list of priorities for you, the things that I think you need to do, but I'm going to start with what you want to work on because I need you to take ownership over all of the issues in your life, not just the ones that I can help you with. And I can't make these changes for you. I can help you make the changes. I can influence your thoughts by how I talk to you. But at the end of the day, I can't get you to quit smoking. You have to do that. At the end of the day, I'm not going to be a part of your life forever. You need somebody to bring food to you. You need to make sure you've got the social services. And if you refuse them or you don't take any action on your own, you're just going to end up right back in the hospital. So we let them identify their priorities. We give them the confidence that they can actually succeed at this stuff, which helps improve the likelihood that when we get to the more medically relevant issues, they're going to have more success. I said this earlier today, and I just want to point out the similarities. We do the same process that you do in traditional EMS. We assess the patient, we stabilize them, we get them to definitive care. The difference is in my assessment as a community paramedic is much broader than just what's broken biologically. The things I work to stabilize are not stabilized by medical interventions. There's not a procedure, there's not a drug I can give to fix these issues. I've got to work the phones. I've got to find the internet sites that we need to get you logged into. I've got to fill out paperwork on your behalf to get you stabilized. And you, and traditionally you must have the emergency department as your sole source of definitive care. I've got a lot more options. Other community organizations, a church in a neighboring county, different people that we can bring into play to help these individuals out. Okay? The other thing I'll share with you is that this is, according to my experience and my medic's experience, some of the most rewarding work I've ever done in EMS. I don't get goosed by grandma, but I have gotten more hugs, and I have been told I'm a saint and a Santa Claus and all these other providers because when you walk into a patient's house and meet them where they are in their health care needs, and you say, I'm on your side, I'm not going to judge you, I'm not going to yell at you, I'm not going to treat you like the ED does when they think you're a drug seeker. I'm here to help. Like, let's work on this together, I'm on your side. That oftentimes is the first time they've had any medical provider, any healthcare provider in general, who's willing to work with them like that. And as a result, they're incredibly appreciative. All right. To end with a quick quote that uh, Ron Stewart gave me, uh, our founder and, uh, and an EMS icon, we can keep building better ways to treat people after they fall off the cliff. We can improve ACLS and all those other things. 
But at the end of the day, really, shouldn't we be building a fence at the top of the cliff to keep people from falling over in the first place? That's the role of community paramedicine.